It's not over yet. Well, make sure it sticks. I know every every one new thing pushes out another. Okay. So, infrared. Obviously, if you had a list of compounds and spectra to match, you could do a good job. But that's not really real life. So the real life would be, I need to determine the molecule, the identity of the molecule. So the first thing you might do is run an IR to determine, is it an alcohol, is it an alkene, is there a carbonyl in it? And that would probably be the, the extent of your running an IR, the information you could get, unless you're matching it. So then the next thing we might do is we might do mass spectrometry. So what is mass spectrometry? Mass spectrometry is going to have two components to it. It's going to let us determine the molecular weight of the molecule. If we're really good, we could probably determine the structure. And if we have a database to compare to, then it'll allow us to actually identify the molecule, or at least identify most of the molecule, or a series of compounds that it would be. So if I can get this down to 10 compounds out of 11 million, pretty good. That's a pretty good screen. So what do we do? In mass spectrometry, what we do is we take our molecule, which is M, and we put it in the gas phase. Now we're going to talk about small molecule mass spectrometry, which means I'm going to heat it. But there's biochemical mass spectrometry. All I got to do is get the mass, is get the molecule into the gas phase. So sometimes you use, people use lasers. Um, there are ways to get proteins and really large molecules into the gas phase, but we won't we won't talk about those. So I get my molecule into the gas phase and then I smash it. I smash it with an electron beam. So the molecule is drawn through the electron beam. When the electron beam hits the molecule, it kicks out an electron. So that molecule has now lost an electron, which means it's unpaired. It also has lost an electron, so it has a positive charge. So that's what's called a radical cation. The radical cation can either stay together or it can start to fragment and break apart. And on Wednesday, we'll talk about fragmentation and the different way different functional groups can fragment, which will be a good review and preview of carbocation stability, resonance, the whole nine yards. So what we have to do is we've got to get the sample into the gas phase. We've got to hit it with the electron beam and then we're going to make our radical cation and we need to measure the mass to charge ratio of all the molecules that are formed. So this is a theoretical mass spectrometer. They don't look like this very much anymore. So we take our molecule, we put it in the gas phase, it gets hit by the electron beam and once it has the charge, then what I do is then if I have charged plates, like a negatively charged plate, I can accelerate that positive charge towards the plate and just leave an opening so that everything that doesn't go through the opening smashes against the side so I can make a beam of molecules or beam of ions. Then I take them into a tube that's at a 90 degree angle and I've got a magnetic field. So the key thing in physics is a moving charge has a magnetic field associated with it. So if you have a moving charge, you can move it. You can make it move by applying a magnetic field. <coughs> this magnetic field I can change by applying more or less current. And so if I set it up for one particular mass to charge ratio, the molecules of that perfect mass to charge ratio make the bend and come down here and be detected. Ones that are too small, uh, ones that are too light, 
will end up smashing into the side of the container or side of the tube. The ones that are wait, sorry, the ones that are too light get drawn in this way. The ones that are too heavy end up smashing into the side that way. They're not bent enough. <coughs> so only what I all, what I have to do then is I scan through the different mass to charge ratios and I count up what shows up on the other side. And this is a really this is kind of the mass spectrometer that like I never used in undergraduate because we had like 13 people that needed to get spectra done. It took a day and there were only like five days left. So I didn't get the chance to use that one. Um, and ours operates by a different but now defunct method. I was told it was obsolete the other week, which didn't make me feel good. But this is how we, this is how, the basics. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to scan and count the number of ions with a mass to charge ratio. Now, you might say, okay, mass to charge ratio, for the most part, the charge is one. In small molecule, mass spectrometry, the charge is one, so it's just a mass. In biomolecular mass spectrometry, if you have a charge of two or three, then you might have to multiply your mass charge by two or three to get the actual molecular weight. So things become much more complicated. As they become complicated, they get big molecules into the gas phase. But small ones, we can heat it. So most of the time, mass spectrometry is, is uh, put together with a GC. So what we have is we have a GC that we can inject the compounds. We can have them separate, and then one by one, they come off into the mass spectrometer where they're detected and their mass spectrum is taken. So the mass spectrum is going to be a scan from... 650 atomic mass units down to like 50. And so we're going to get a mass spectrum out of this. And so then once they're into the, once the molecules go into the mass spectrometer, we count them as well as get, um, as well as get the mass spectrum out of it. So this is the GC mass spec, which again is on all the TV shows. And which can do wonderful things, but not at 60 minutes. There is our GCMS. It's on the other side of the room. You guys didn't make it over there. Um, I don't know that we'll be using this one to analyze any of our products. Right now it's being heavily used by Dr. Saparito, who studies those cute little poison dart frogs and what kinds of toxins are in them because the poison dart frogs aren't poison until they eat something that they, they can make the toxins out of. So he studies what toxins are in the frog. The frog gets to live. So it's not like he's killing little poison dart frogs. He's not. And, but he probably does kill the insects that they eat. So that's, what, that's um, how it's used. I'll, talk, I'll show you a little bit about stuff we, we can do with essential oils and perfumes and, and other things. So this is ours. We've got the GC. The GC part is on the left and the mass spectrometer part is on the right. So the GC looks like a standard GC, not like our GCs next door that have huge columns because we inject crap in them, um, but this one has a smaller GC that will really separate compounds out well. And then the mass spectrometer part is on the right-hand side and there's nothing to see. Because the mass spectrometer has to be in a high vacuum system, because as you're moving these molecules in the system, you don't want them bumping into air molecules. So it has to be under a very high vacuum, as to most, as to all uh, mass spec systems. So there's nothing to see there. So here's what happens. What happens is, is that if I have a mixture or a sample, I inject it into the GC, the top is a GC trace. So each one of those peaks is a individual component. And then if I click on that component, I've recorded its mass spectrum. So the mass spectrum here is below. Now if the molecule, if that radical cation part makes it through intact without breaking apart, then the biggest peak 
that will be the molecular weight of the molecule. So for instance, this peak where the flag is on top, that compound weighs 154 mass units. And you might say, well, that, that's nice, but what does it tell me? It can tell me a lot, which I'll get to in a minute. Well, so the most that the molecule can weigh is itself intact. So the biggest peak farthest to the right is going to be the molecular weight of that compound. And that's sometimes that's called the m dot plus or m plus dot peak. And you can see there's nothing beyond 154. Now, if you're going to look at that little teeny tiny peak at 155, I'll tell you where that comes from in a minute. But that's the biggest peak. If I saw stuff beyond 200 or beyond that peak, it's all contamination. Now, what are the peaks below 154? Those are fragments. And so, for instance, this 154 peak, when it becomes 139, if my math is correct, it means it lost 15, there's a loss of 15 um, mass units to go from 154 to 139. That loss of 15 mass units would correspond to a carbon, which is 12, plus three hydrogens which is 15, so that means the molecule broke apart and lost the methyl group. So I could conclude that there's a methyl group in this molecule. Somewhat helpful. And we're going to talk more about this on Wednesday. The critical part of the mass spectrum is, if you don't want to get into the analysis of the compound, it's another spectrum that I can use to match. So I can computer match that spectrum to a database of about 300,000 compounds. And it'll tell me, um, hey, this is an 80% match to this spectrum. So I can do that for every single peak in the molecule, or every single peak, which is a molecule in the sample. So, this will work on nanograms per milliliter scale. Um, when I'm running essential oils, I believe I was running samples at, I started out with 10 microliters in a milliliter, and then I went and diluted it down to um, at least 10 nanograms per milliliter. So it, you can get a mass spectrum from a very small sample. Where is mass spectrometry used? Well, one of the places where you have very small samples is in drug testing. So if you go to the Olympics or you know some place like that, they will have a portable mass spec unit. And they will be taking mass specs of the P's of all athletes. Because what they're looking for is they're looking for metabolites from illicit substances. And so they'll be t that's how they test is with mass spectrometry. So if they think you've taken some anabolic steroid, they know what the metabolites are from that anabolic steroid, and so but they'll be looking for that in your urine or whatever, hair or whatever they take. So this is how most drug testing is done. Is by, is by GC mass spectrometry. So the highest peak is going to give us the molecular weight. I'm going to show you in a moment how we get molecular formulas from that. And then the masses and fragments and their abundance, in other words, the spectrum, we can, that gives us a fingerprint to work off of. So fragmentation patterns. So what happens when a molecule goes when we put the molecule into the mass spectrometer. We'll take something simple like methane. 
So with methane, an intact methane molecule is going to have a CH4 dot plus. It's going to weigh 16. If that molecule decides to lose a hydrogen, it's going to do it one of two ways. So when you have a CH4 dot plus, this can lose an H plus or it can lose an H dot. If it loses the H plus, we make a CH3 dot. If it loses the H dot, we make a CH3 plus. Now, I would never be allowed to write a CH3 plus in lecture. That's worse than a primary carbocation. But this is a high energy environment. It's in the gas phase. It's in a heated environment. So this is a high energy environment. So that CH3 plus would be actually, wouldn't be stable, but it would be observed. So we're going to write carbocation structures that we're not allowed to write in lecture. But I'm in a high, high energy environment. I'm in a totally different environment at this point. So when this CH4 dot plus breaks apart, it can either give us an H dot with a CH3 plus or an H plus with a CH3 dot. The problem is anything that doesn't have a charge doesn't get moved by the magnetic field. So that means the CH3 dot runs into the side of the container runs into the side of the instrument, never makes it to the de detector. So in general, what we only, we only see the carbocations that we're going to generate. So what we're going to do on Wednesday is we're going to take a molecule and we're gonna, we can fragment it different ways. The one we're going to see more abundance, a bigger peak, is the more stable carbocation. And so that's why we're going to review and preview carbocation stability because the mass spectrum is going to show us which one of those two possibilities is more, is more abundant, therefore more stable. So the, meth, the methane loses one atomic mass unit to go down to CH3+. Plus. The CH3+, plus can lose an H dot to get me to a CH2 dot plus, or I can lose an H plus to get me to a CH2 dot. Again, the neutral species, the CH2 dot, smash into the canate, into the walls of the instrument. The CH plus dot got a charge, and so we're going to see that. We're going to see this CH2 plus dot species. Now notice that as the molecule fragments more and more, the peak gets smaller because there's less abundance. So we're really only going to see one fragmentation. But if we have a big molecule and I can fragment it 10 different ways, we're going to see all those combinations. So that's kind of how the fragmentation will operate. We're going to break the molecule apart to either form a plus and a dot, or a dot and a plus, depending on the two species that we're breaking. Now, I see a little peak at 17. I see a little teeny tiny peak at 17. What's that? Well, that's still CH4 dot plus. But now what I'm looking at is now I'm looking at the isotopes of carbon. So I'm looking actually here at a molecule of methane that doesn't have a carbon-12 isotope, but it has a carbon-13 isotope, which is much rarer. So if this... CH4 peak is the M dot plus, the molecular weight peak. This is called the M plus 1 peak. So it's the molecular weight plus 1. And you can tell a lot of information about what the molecule is, particularly what kind of halide you have. <coughs> 
Do you have a chlorine, bromine, or iodine? You can tell that from the M plus one piece. So that's a carbon 13. And you might say, okay, what is that going to tell me? Um, bond association energy isn't going to tell me a whole lot. So here's some spectra. There's nonane. Nonane is going to be C9, H20, and I'm assuming it's going to weigh 128. And so you can see the molecular dot plus ion is there. And then all the fragment peaks as we move down the line. A 3-methylpentane weighs 86, so we can see its um, molecular, molecular weight or molecular ion. So the first aspect of this is we're getting the molecular weight of the molecule. Who cares? Well, if somebody hands me something and says, can you figure out what this is, a molecular formula would be really helpful. So what you can do is, if you can get the M dot plus molecular weight, you can actually screen out a lot of potential molecular formulas. So this printout that's actually like in a, from the book it's actually with the dot matrix printer, which nobody in here has probably ever seen, except, you know, it's really poor quality. But that peak, the, the molecule that we saw from the GCMS, that weighed 154 units. Here's the formula, the different formulas that will add up to 154. There's not that many. I mean, out of 11 million organic compounds, I'm down to 15 possible formulas. And so that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. Now there is something called exact mass spectrometry where the instrument is so sensitive that it will give me the molecular weight of the molecule down to four decimal points. And that takes into account all the isotopes of all the elements. So if I have an instrument that, that sensitive, which I don't, case does, if I can get the exact mass to three or four decimal points, I'm going to narrow this list down to even more. So I'll have a really good idea of how many carbons, how many hydrogens, if there's nitrogen or oxygen present, I'm going to have a decent idea where to start with this molecule. Now, even if I'm at 154 with no more decimal points, I'm still starting out pretty well. And one of the things, one of the ways that I'm, I'm starting out well is this. I go back to my, my molecule, my methane molecule. Well, for methane, carbon-13 is 1.1% of the carbon in a sample. So carbon-12 is 98.9, carbon-13 is 1.1, and the radioactive carbon-14 that's used for radioactive dating is the remainder, which is less than 1%. So that carbon-13 then is 1.1% of my, of my product. What I can do in order to get the number of carbons in the spectrum, or number of carbons in the sample is, take this intensity of the M plus one peak. So if I take the M plus one peak and I divide it through by the total intensity of the, of the molecular weight peak, 
basically what I know is for every carbon that's in that molecule, I'm going to have 1.1% of that being carbon-13. So if I have one carbon, it's, that peak is going to be 1.1%. If it's 10 carbons, it's going to be 11.1%. So if I measure that ratio of M plus 1 to M and then multiply it, it'll tell me, multiply it by 100, it'll then tell me, okay, this is how many carbons you have in your sample. So if I ended up with like 8%, 8 point something percent, then I'd say, oh, I think I've got eight carbons in there. I go back to my possible formulas and I eliminate everything that doesn't have eight carbons in it. So if you want a molecular weight of a formula, you can get that from mass spectrometry. And so that's pretty useful because from one spectrum, I just got a potential or a potential or other potential molecular weights and molecular formulas. So that's very useful from the standpoint of this. What else? So here's just a chart of some of the different elements and what their isotopic ratios are. Now let's say you have an alkyl halide and you don't know whether there's bromine or chlorine attached to it. Let's say you wanted to prove or validate some of the stuff we learn in lecture. And even though this is lab, I'm allowed to bring in lecture stuff. Let's say that you wanted to know who's a better nucleophile, chlorine or bromine. So you say, well, I'm going to take isopropyl iodide and I'm going to react it with a 50-50 mixture of chlorine and bromine. And then I'm going to measure the product and see which, the, which one there's more of. Is there more chlorine or is there more bromine? And then that's going to tell me which one of those two nucleophiles is better. So when I finally make my compound and it has my halogen there, how am I going to tell the difference between whether it's chlorine or bromine? Well, I'm going to look at the isotopic ratios and I'm going to see that there's a bromine 79 and a bromine 81. And they're almost 50-50 in terms of their isotopic ratios. But on the other hand, the chlorine is, there's a chlorine 35 and there's a chlorine 37, and so the chlorine 35 is 75 percent, not 50-50. And if there's an iodine, there's really one, only one isotope of iodine. Now you might say, well, why don't you just measure the molecular weight of that molecule, and since bromine weighs, you know, 80 and chlorine weighs 36, you'll definitely know which molecule is attached or which hal halogens attached by the difference in molecular weights. Okay, that'll work. But what'll also work is to look at the molecular, is to look at the M, the M plus dot species, because in the case of chlorine, you'll have one mass. The molecules that contain chlorine 35 are going to have an intensity of 75 relative to the heavier ones of 37 that are only going to weigh, that are going to have a lower intensity because the chlorine 35 ratio is higher than the chlorine 37. So you're going to see two mass peaks two molecular ion peaks and they're going to tell you exactly what you have. If you saw that versus a 50-50, if it was nearly 50-50 it would be bromine. If it's a 75-25 it's going to be chlorine. 
Right? So we could do, we could actually prove or discover, well, I guess, we could discover what we learn in lecture. Let's see, note to self, make sure you hand out the grade, the homework IR problems after, after lecture. So that's how we would, that's how we would get the, that's one of the things we could do. So these isotopic ratios help us. So then here's a couple examples for this bromine. We see two peaks in the, in the molecular ion, the molecular weight region, and they're 50-50. If you get two bromines, then you get different, then you get the possibility of they both Bromine 79s, one's a 79 and 81, and one's and the two are 81. So you see three peaks instead of two. For chlorine, here's an example of a 75. Here's the example of 7525. And then for iodine, there's just one peak. Again, the molecular weights of these compounds are going to be different, but these patterns are very helpful in terms of determining what kind of halogen you have attached to the organic molecule. So that's another piece of information that we can get. And then fluorine, there's only really one, there's only fluorine 19, so there's not isotopes of that. Sulfur is annoying because it has a sulfur 32 and a 34 that gives these types of patterns. And then you can actually have a chart like this that shows all the different possible pattern combinations of whether you've got chlorine or bromine or mixed, whether you got sulfur, bromine, chlorine. And so you can tell from the mass spec, from the molecular weight pattern what kinds of elements you have present. And so that's really helpful. Uh, let's see. There's another one that we run into all the time. So let's see, what is this? What is this sample? This is Miller Natural Light. So Dr. Miller Natural Light beer. So beers get skunky because there's thiols in them that get released. And so she wanted to know whether or not we could detect those thiols from the skunky beer. And I don't, there's probably some GCMS stuff that goes on with beers, but there's a whole lot of another technique that we're not going to talk about that's used to analyze beers and to look at if there's rat, if radicals get in the beer, then uh, that just all hell breaks loose and you get skunky beer and all sorts of things. So people love to measure the radicals that are in beer, which involves another technique called ESR, of which we have an instrument that nobody knows how to use. And the minute I get $40,000 in cash, it's gone, because they'll trade it. They'll trade the one we have and $40,000 for one that we can use, but don't have that money yet. So what we did was we took a sample of the headspace, the gas, off the beer, and we injected it into the sample, and we got all these peaks, all those GC peaks, and we were like, oh, is any one of those a thiol, meaning a thiol is an SH compound instead of an OH compound. And thiols, it's skunky because skunks are locked and loaded with lots of methane thiol, which is CH3SH. So when they get aggravated, that's what they unload. And so that smells like a skunk. That compound is also a natural gas. So if you smell skunky stuff coming from your pipes, get out, because you got a natural gas leak. And they put that in there because you can't smell methane. So. We looked at all those peaks and it's like, really, there's that many peaks, organic compounds in the headspace. And there were none. 
because what we did was every time we looked at a peak, we saw this kind of pattern. We saw a pattern that was kind of like a skateboard ramp. And that pattern is actually consistent with a silicon. Silicon has that isotope pattern. So unfortunately, what that meant was that those are compounds that are actually decomposing off the column because the column is made of a silicon compound. And so the molecules are, it's constantly bleeding silicon compounds. And so every one of those was a silicon compound. We couldn't tell whether it was, whether there was any skunkiness or not. So that's something that when we use a mass spectrometer, we have to be careful of because once we see that peak, it's not a real peak. It's something that's a contaminant within the instrument. If it gets too bad, then I gotta clean it out. So what do we what do we do to make to make measurements? How do they use mass spectrometry in a sort of a forensic environment? What we do is we have access to different databases. I think what we have right now, or what we did have, was a NIST. To a, NIST is the National Institutes of Standard and Technology. They're the people who are charged with like making sure that a kilogram weighs a kilogram. So they're in charge of all standards. And so they collect all spectra and put it in a database so that we can compare our spectrum to authentic samples and use that as a match. I don't, right now I don't, that's not on our computer because after a power outage, our computer crashed, and it wasn't revivable. So, and it was a Windows XP computer, and Windows XP doesn't exist anymore. So I had to buy a Windows XP off of Amazon, take some crap from the ITS department in doing so, and then Dr. Saparito and I had to spend like a day bringing the system back up again. Well, we did. Then I wanted to get an, a spare computer in case this ever happens again and took more crap from my PS. It is what it is. But I haven't installed that database back in yet because I don't know if I can. So here's how, here's how we can make a preliminary identification of a molecule in a sample. So here's lavender. Lavender essential oil. You did cloves last semester or when you've taken organic before. So we did the cloves. We made clove essential oil. Take lavender seed or lavender flowers, you can make lavender essential oil. It's supposed to help you sleep. So if you take a lavender sample and you run it through the GCMS, you get the gas chromatograph on top. You click on a peak, and this is the same peak as before, it weighs 154. What is that compound? I don't know, but I have a mass spectrum of this. And so I can then take the mass spectrum and I can compare it to the database. So I do that, and it gives me a whole list of potential compounds. And it tells me what their percentages are. So for instance, the first six hits are eucalyptol, which is a compound that smells like eucalyptus, hence the name. Usually when I see six or seven of the same components in my search list, that's probably it. You might say, how come there's six different samples in the database? Because six samples came from six different samples came from different people. So it's saying that all six of those are a pretty decent match from 77% all the way up to 82% match. That's not bad. So I would conclude that's probably eucalyptol. Down here it would show me how the spectra are matching up visually, which I don't have statistics eyes, so 
they look pretty good, but that's where we rely on the math. And then if I don't know what eucalyptol looks like, there's its structure. It's one of those bicyclic compounds that we talked about before with an oxygen on the bridge. So if it's in the database, it's there. I can actually get more information from each entry as to where they found it. And so a lot of those are going to be steam distillate of lavender flowers. So I could do that for every peak in here, and I could basically make a determination of what that compound potentially is. Oop, I'm done. I'm not quite done yet. So if somebody hands you a sample and you really want to you want to know sort of what it is, you can determine the individual components, but that the individual components won't necessarily help you. So my last my last example here is that uh, Dr. Weiner got a sample of what looked like a piece of amber. And he wouldn't tell me what it was, and he wouldn't tell me where it came from. He just said, can we figure out what this is? And I get suspicious when nobody will tell me where it came from. So I'm like, well, let's try an NMR, and it didn't work out all that well. But we took a little sliver of the amber, and we put it into a solvent, and we took the mass spec of it. And for each one of these compounds, we found out what its probable probability was. And then we looked at the individual component where it came from in the database. And so we started finding out things like this amber was found in varnishes or it was found in tree saps. And so it became clear that that was where most of these compounds' origins were. So. He's like, okay, well, that's helpful. And I'm like, where did it come from? And what did they think it was? And then he's like, okay. It came from an old cross down in a church in Cleveland, a Catholic church. There's a little drop of something coming off the cross. And he goes, well, I kind of thought it was blood and a miraculous kind of something miraculous, which it was. And it was just basically the... The wood was so old that the varnish and some of the components of the wood were just basically coming out. Sort of the way, if you've ever seen old pane glass, because glass isn't necessarily completely solid, it's like a thick liquid that you see in some of the, well, some of the um, windows in New England, some of the really old houses, the glass is thicker at the bottom than it is at the top. So you get kind of that wavy approach. That's sort of what happened with this cross. So I'm like, okay, was it that difficult to tell me what it was? And he's like, well, apparently there were other chemists that would that would that were making fun of that question and whether or not that answer was possible. The the answer of, of something being miraculous. And I'm like, well, we just find out what it is. So it's just this piece of tree it was just kind of the varnish was running on it. And you can do that with some of these samples. So what they do on TV, what they do on TV is, is possible, but sometimes it takes more time than what they show. And so is it possible for somebody to hand me something and have me tell them what it is and I have no idea what it is? Sometimes it is. So the, the woman who had the bread that smelled like fingernail polish remover, what I did there to figure out that it was ethyl acetate that was coming out of the bag. I put a piece of bread in a tube, I heated it up, and I took the gas that came off of that and injected it into the mass spectrum. I got a peak. I got a peak with a particular molecular weight. I didn't know what the molecular weight was, so I used the charts to figure out the possibilities. And then it's like, oh, it's ethyl acetate. Then I go down to the stock room, get an authentic bottle of ethyl acetate, inject it, it comes out at the same time with the same mass spectrum. Okay, it's ethyl acetate, that makes sense. Because she thought, well, she thought they were poisoning her and she was gonna go to the local TV, but um, I think they avoided that. <laughs>
with that. But that's what happens with with those compounds. And then when you look at the literature, you find that when you look at the literature, you find that um, people make all trying to make all sorts of molecules by letting yeast chew on all sorts of proteins. So I, I'm almost I'm almost done. You know, the tw you know, me twenty five years ago would have used far more colorful language. Far more colorful language. So, so this so this is the first half of mass spectrometry. What we'll do Wednesday is we'll talk about the nitty gritty details of fragmentation, and I will give you homework problems that will do be due on. We'll make them do. Uh, we can make them do Monday, but then you guys have a test on Monday. So I think we'll still make them do on Monday. If you get them done on Thursday, that's fine. But we'll make them do on Monday. You don't need. There's no. There's no lab textbook. All the handouts are going to be online. Lab notebook. You don't need that. But you will next Thursday. Okay. So, and those problems are due on Wednesday. What? At the beginning of class. Like well, let's see. I've learned my lesson that if they're not due at the beginning of class, you're going to work on them while I'm lecturing on the rest of mass spectrometry. So, yes, they will be due at the beginning of lab. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow, I guess.